morning, guys. How are you doing today? Good. It's good to see your faces full of life, full of excitement. Everybody move around a little bit. And uh, it's an exciting morning. I, I have something really uh, that, that I'm uh, uh, really passionate about and really excited to share with all of you guys this morning. Uh, before we get into it, how many of you guys were so excited when you walked outside and felt like spring? It's like you can, you know, kind of breathe. Winter's coming to an end. It feels like life's happening again, right? Good, good stuff. So today, I want to I talk to you guys about something. Um, one of, probably what I see is like the, one of the greatest questions that all of us could ever ask. Probably the greatest, greatest question that we can all ask. Everyone is. Um, and and, and, and th- th- uh, that, that's a bold statement. That's a big, big thing to say. Like the greatest question you could ask. Maybe even like the greatest issue facing the entire world. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Of, of things that, that you know, are, are problems in the world. There's a lot of things we can spend our time thinking about, devoting our attention to. Um, but there's, there's one thing that I see um, in, in Scripture, one question I think that all of us need to be asking. That honestly, I don't see enough people asking this question. And the question is simply this. Who is Jesus? Do, do I really, put another way, do I really know Jesus? It is, is it, do I know him deeply, intimately? Who is Jesus? I think that this is the question that everything hinges on. Every other question is secondary to the revelation of knowing Jesus, truly knowing him. Um, there, there's a, a, a theologian named Dallas Willard. He said this. He said, the greatest issue facing the world today, bold statement again, the greatest issue facing the world today with all of its heartbreaking needs, is whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will become disciples. Students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from Him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. Put put that in this way. I think it's a beautiful way to put it. Will those who claim Christ's name ever truly know Him. Is that possible? To know God? To know Jesus intimately the way that you know a friend uh, deeper than you know a friend in a deeper relationship and a deeper friendship than you have with your, your closest friend, with your spouse? Is that possible? The Bible tells us it's possible. Uh, The Bible tells us that that is what is reality, that that is the goal, that that's the thing that Jesus came to offer. And so I I really believe this with all of my heart, that if there is one single question that you center your entire life around, it is this, who (coughs) is Jesus? And can I come to know him? Uh, A few weeks ago, I read out of uh, the book of Hebrews, and I just want to read this passage again out of Hebrews chapter 1. Um, verse 1, it says this. This is a beautiful, beautiful text. It says, Long ago, in many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. This, then, then, this. He says this. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And he's speaking the truth that, that through the person of Jesus and that through the gospels, through the story of Jesus coming into the world and the words that Jesus said, and the life that he lived and his death on the cross and his resurrection, through this we have seen the exact person of God. When we have seen who he truly is. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. The thing that shines about God's nature is found completely in Jesus. And, 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 and the way that the New Testament writers spoke of him was that through knowing Jesus, we find life. So, okay, that's the theme. That's the thing that we're going to dive into and talk about. But, but there's, there's, there's some stuff that we've got to unpack for. Because a lot of times past since Jesus walked the earth, right? 
2,000 years ago, Jesus walked the earth, and a lot of life has happened, and a lot of things have changed, and we live in a culture, in a world that's way, way different than the place that Jesus lived, and the time that Jesus lived, and the way that people interacted with the other each other, the way that they saw each other, the way that they, they, they saw God is different than, than our modern culture and the days and the ways that we live in. Um, and and, and so, so most of what we see in Christianity and in faith today, I believe, pales in comparison to the life that Jesus had in the Gospels and the life of his first followers. That, that, like The life that Jesus lived was vibrant and full of excitement. Jesus was always, uh, he, he was always bringing something beautiful and wonderful to the world. And the way that he lived was unlike anybody else in all of the world, in all of history. And his first followers carried that out so, so well. And, and to, be, to be honest, I, I, I don't see that as much in our lives today. That it just vibrant, filled, overflowing life. It's enticing for other people that people want to get close to because they see something different and beautiful and unique in it, like they saw in Jesus. And sure, Jesus was, uh, uh, he, he was like, and still is, like, divisive, right? Like, people would come into contact with Jesus and they would go, like, he is just too much. <laughs> I don't know if I can deal with how much he is, right? And he would say things that were so bold. That it would, you know, people would be like, I don't think I can accept that. And it's still the case today. But I think that most of our problem isn't that we are too vibrant and too bold and too filled with life. I think that it's we're too dull, to be honest. That we have maybe too much of ourselves and that's not enough of Jesus. And so um, some things that I've noticed about, about our lives and about Christianity in general. As I look at uh, the, just the divisiveness that I see in people visions that we've created between one another and that most of the conversations that I see happening online and the most of the conversations that, that, that people hide behind the, their screens on are, 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 are divisive and hate-filled and that are putting off this just terrible view of Christians and who we are and that's what we've become because we're more about what we're against than being about people who are centered around the person of Jesus. And, and I think that, that a lot of this is because we've replaced really knowing Jesus with knowing about him. I think that's one of, one of, the, one of the main things that, that we see at work in our culture and work in all of our lives, that, that we think that knowing about God or knowing enough things in the Bible or knowing about Jesus is the same thing as, as knowing him. And it's, it's just, it's not. Uh, I, I can say that I know everything there is to know about my wife or my kids, but if I don't actually interact with them, if I don't have daily conversation with them, if I don't step into their presence of their life face to face, then I don't really know them. And I can know all there is to know about them, but I don't really know them. And it, it is the exact same way with, with Jesus. It's the same way with our walk with Jesus. God, that, that we, we can't replace knowing Him with knowing about Him. Knowing about Him is a portion of it. And, and it's, it's so important that we, we get it right and that we understand truly who He is. But that's not the fullness of knowing Him, of really stepping into a relationship with Him. And, it, and there's, there's so many reasons, but one of the reasons is because it's difficult. Because it, it, it doesn't always make sense. It's easier to, um, to to try to wrap our minds around the knowledge about God in our heads because we live in a culture that elevates head knowledge above everything else. And, and, and we've even centered you know, church and teaching and all of this stuff around our own intellectual ability to understand things. And then, like, if we know more about God, then that makes us, you know, higher than everybody else. If we're the smartest person in the room, then we must, you know, be the best person in the room. And that's really the kind of culture that we live in. But um, Jesus offered something so drastically different. And, um, you know, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about this very, very specific thing. Um, it says that, that the goal 
of what God is doing in the church is that we come to full knowledge of Him. And the, the, the words, knowledge that they were talking about were something so much deeper than our head knowledge. It was truly knowing Him and becoming a mature person. Growing up in Christ. And that the, as we grow up in Christ, know Him more deeply, more intimately, both personally and in the context of the community that we live in. As we grow up and mature in Christ, um, he, he says this, that we won't be tossed to and fro by the waves of doctrine and human cunning. And, and, and that's what it can become. The, 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 uh, the, the knowledge of God can become doctrines that carry us away in waves, that are based more on our, uh, our, our, our lack of unity with other believers than it is our unity through the blood of Christ that we have with one another, more about the things that we disagree on than about Jesus himself. And that's why we have hundreds of different denominations and why there's so many churches in this town and in every town all over. That's why there's so many divisions because we make these dividing lines based on what we're against rather than what we're for. And, and, and there was, there's always been people like this, right? There's always been people who put uh, knowing about God in front of really knowing him. And the, the, the people, the class of people in Jesus' time like this were the Pharisees. There's this one moment, that, there's so many moments that Jesus had been encountering what, what their view of God was and trying to redirect it and see the heart of God. But there's this one particular moment in Matthew chapter 15 where they come to Jesus and they're like, hey, why don't your disciples follow this tradition of washing their hands? But why don't they do this? And, and he actually brought this up multiple times because this is a big hang-up for him. And, and Jesus just looks at him. He doesn't even answer the question. And he says, why don't you follow the commands of God? <laughs> and he, he says, look, you are disobeying one of the Ten Commandments. And this was extremely offensive to them. It's like, you're not honoring your father and mother. And you're telling other people to dishonor their father and mother because of a certain tradition that you have. And, and when you tell people that it's more important that they bring a tithe than to take care of their father and mother, you're disobeying the law of Christ. And then he says this. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus came pointing out all of these truths often. Constantly, over and over, he would say things like this to, to the, you know, the religious elite people and the Pharisees and stuff like that. He would say, look, you, you think that you know about God, but you don't know his heart. Because you've, you've turned it into this doctrine and you've turned it into this, this list of things that you can understand and wrap your mind around God. It's led you to a place that's far from the heart of God. And then Jesus had a drastically different outcome in mind. Um, he, he truly came to bring us to the heart of the Father. In his own heart, uh, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to God except for me. That, that he literally came to bring us to the heart. He came so that God could be known. And, and the ones who, who knew Jesus the most intimately, the ones who were the closest followers of Jesus, the ones, the ones who walked with him and spoke with him and who were there, through, through all of this, they spoke the most clearly about this. And, and I, I always go back to, uh, to John, uh, the Apostle John, who called himself, you know, the one who Jesus loved. You know, uh, it's a little bit, you know, the self-righteousness that he's got in his time who Jesus loved. And, you know, people were reading that. Like, but, but really, honestly, that's a beautiful way to see yourself. Um, he, he knew that Jesus loved him. He, he was there in the most intimate moments of Jesus' life. It was, it was because of his surrender. Now, I mean, he got carried away, he was human, he did all these other things. But the way that Jesus, or that, that John spoke of Jesus was, was that of, of not just somebody who knew about him, but somebody who knew him intimately, close. And in fact, in, in, his, uh, in his, his book, uh, First John, which was written to the church, about 60 years after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, he, he begins this letter to the church like this. He says, he says that, um, I'm speaking to you about what I've heard and what I've seen with my eyes and what I touched with my own hands. That, that the word of life 
that, that the one who is life, Jesus, who was in the beginning with God, was God, like he said in his gospels, that we saw him and we heard his voice and we touched him with our hands and we followed him and we walked with him and we lived with him and we ate with him. We were there. And what I'm telling you about what we saw is that he revealed God to us. That we knew him intimately. And, and, and as he says in, in verse 3, and that which we've seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus. The ones who knew Jesus the most intimately spoke the most clearly that what Jesus came to offer was Himself. A relationship with Him. Truthfully, not just knowing about Him, not just believing the right things about Him, but knowing him. And so he writes, and I want to look at that just, just for a moment, I want to go back to, to John chapter 1 in the beginning of his gospel, because so much of these two uh, echo the same thing. And when he writes in 1 John in the letter, uh, echoes what he wrote in the gospel of John. Um, and and, and this, this is what he, he sees, these beautiful words that he, he began to describe the person of Jesus as saying, look, this, this Jesus that we knew and that we saw, he, he, was, he was fully God. He, he, was, he was fully infinite divinity. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. And then he, he, all things that were created were created through him. At his word, he was the word of God that went out. And then all things were made through. And, and then, then we saw him and, and when we beheld him when we came close to him when we when we when he called us out of our own life and we began to follow him what we saw was life like nothing else and then here's here's the thing that I I I, I, I want all followers of Jesus to understand and begin to step into that when you know Jesus life comes vibrantly alive. This this is what John was writing that it was like seeing clearly for the first time. That, that he says, in him was life. And his life was the light of men. His light shines in the darkness, and the darkness came on the to come. It's like I was blind. I couldn't see. And when I met Jesus, I could see clearly for the first time. To, to know Jesus, and the closer you draw to Jesus, the more vibrantly alive you become. Because you're stepping into intimacy with life himself. With the one who is life and who created all things, you come to know real life. You come to know what you were created for because you're coming close to the creator. You, you come to know what you were made for because he's the one who made you. Your eyes see clearly because you're seeing through the eyes who made them. You see others in the way that, that He created them because you're walking with the one who made them too. Life comes alive the closer you get to the person of Jesus. And, and it, here's, here's what He begins to say after that. He said in verse, verse 9, He says, the true life. He, he goes on, He tells like, John the Baptist came proclaiming about the life that was coming and about the person that was coming. But He wasn't the light. He, he just came to bear witness about the light. He came to say hey, there's somebody coming ahead of me. And John was this vibrant, full of life kind of guy that people didn't know what to do with, right? Like in the, the, the birth of John the Baptist, his father said like, hey, he's going to be filled with God's spirit from the day he's born. He's going to be a great person. Uh, he literally jumps inside of his mother's room when he comes close to Jesus. I, like, People were expecting, what is this guy going to do? Jesus even said, like, this is the greatest person who's ever been born of women. Like, the greatest one who's ever been born. So what did he do? He lived his life proclaiming that Jesus was coming. He, he, he had nothing. He, like, he wore camel hair and ate stuff out of the wild and was this kind of wild guy that people didn't know what to do with, but his entire life was lived proclaiming that Jesus is coming. And, and so you need to be ready. 
And that's, so, so repent, turn to Him, like get rid of anything in, in, inside of your heart that's going to keep you from Him because He's coming. He's making Himself known. And then John writes this, that the true light, which is light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. Think about that for a minute. He made the world it's by His Word that the, the heavens and the earth, that all things were created. And yet He steps into the world. He comes to His own. It says that the, the, He made, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. And yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people didn't receive Him. There's this heartbreaking truth about the, the, the life that Jesus, when He steps into the world that He created, that His desire is to be known. That like Jesus became a human. The, 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 the Word of God that created all things. The, the, the God who was with Moses. The one who spoke to Moses, who said, hey, nobody can come near me or else they're going to die. He wanted to be known so much that, that he became flesh. That he took on our humanity so that he could be known. So that we could see him. So we could walk with him and hear his voice. So that the world would know him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son so that whosoever would believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life forever. The, the one who created all things took on flesh and dwelt among us, became flesh so that he could be known. If there's any doubt in your mind, if, if God wants to be known, you have to look no farther than Jesus. He came to be known. He came so that others could come to His presence, so that others could follow Him, could walk with Him. And the very world that He made didn't recognize Him. The very people who, who were called by His name, who He had set apart, didn't know it was Him. That they had followed him for all these years. He was the one who had brought them out of Egypt, who had rescued them, who had redeemed them, who had promised them all of these things and kept coming to them and keep, kept drawing near to him over and over. And now he was here in the world and did not recognize him. And I think this is one of the most heartbreaking things about, about the, 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 the words that we see um, Jesus give to, to those who were close to him. Uh, even his closest followers didn't truly recognize him until after he was gone. There's this, there's this beautiful moment uh, towards the end of his life where one of his disciples looks at him and says, Look, show us the way to the Father. If you, if you just show us the way, if you, if you tell us how to get there, then we'll believe. And Jesus looks directly at him and he says... I've been with you all this time and you don't know me. It's heartbreaking because Jesus wants to be known. And the greatest thing that you can ever do, the greatest question that you can ever center in your life around is this. Do I know Jesus? Do I really know him? Not just know about him, not just have the right beliefs, but do I know him? Have I stepped into a relationship with him? Because that's what he came to bring this invitation is scandalous. And then and it upset people then and it still upsets people today because, because his invitation is to everybody. It's not just for the people who are living right or who are believing the right way. His invitation comes before all of that. And before you can believe the right things about him, he asks everyone to come. To come. Come. Come follow. Come. Draw near. And he's, he's made that clear through the cross. That the work on the cross was to bring all people near. Those who were near and those who were far away have been brought into the presence of God. the blood of the Lamb. Everyone is invited. Everyone. 
this is this is this is scandalous. This is hard for some people to believe. We see, we see it all over. We see people who get up up tight about it, who who go up in arms about saying, well, no, 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 no everybody's not invited. Jesus didn't really want everybody yet. Like you 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 gotta. There's there's this belief in Christianity that says you gotta fix yourself before you can come near to Christ. That, that you have to be clean first. But Jesus said Himself. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. It's, it's not the ones who are healthy who need a doctor. But it's the ones who are sick. And any of the people who have this same uh, mentality about God, he said, look, you need to go and learn what God truly is about. You need to learn his heart. Go and remember this. Go and look the scripture up. That, that what I desire is mercy. That God wants to be no, all people. Before he fixes us, before we try to fix ourselves, his invitation of the cross is for all people. No, no matter what your background is, and you know what, all of us, we have different beliefs about God because you grew up in a certain home with with a family that believed a certain way or didn't believe a certain way. You grew up in a church that believed a certain way or didn't or this version, or that version, and then life has happened, and you've come to, to your own beliefs based on the hurts and the pains that you've experienced, and the ways that, that you believe that God has came through, or the disappointments about the way that He hasn't. Um, we all have differences in the ways that we believe, and every person who's alive has differences in, in the ways that they believe. And no matter where they come from, where they land on the political spectrum, and I just want to remind you guys that this is a, a, a election year, and so this is super important. Because if, if you, if you uh, uh, div make dividing lines based on where you stand on the political spectrum, then you're not making the same lines that Jesus made. That his love is for everybody. Whether you're on the left or on the right. He wants to redeem all people. Whether, whether you, you have um, a, a, a certain difficulty with one sin or another, whether you're gay or straight, whether you're any number of things that we make these dividing lines on, Jesus' invitation is to all. All people. No matter your background, no matter who you think that you are, He wants all people to come to Himself. <coughs> So that they can know him first. And it's the knowing that begins a transformation. If we begin to make the dividing lines first of saying you can't come to Christ if you are this way or this way or this way. Then we're not being like Christ. We're not loving like Jesus. We're not being his hands and feet. And we're not mature believers who truly know him. Because we're putting the wrong thing first. Change happens. God wants transformation. He hates sin. He does not want you or anybody to live in sin. But for that to happen, you have to know Him first. And others have to know Him too. Because change doesn't happen the other way around. You don't change and then come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and then are changed. You cannot make transformation happen in your own strength. It only happens for knowing Jesus. So John goes on and he says this. He says, to all who did receive him, he came into the world and then didn't recognize him to his very own who should have known him more than anybody else. They didn't even know him. But to anybody, anyone, and, and, and he would have had vivid understanding of what anyone meant because it was disruptive to him. Because as a young Jewish boy uh, who was called to follow, he was also called to follow in the same presence as people who he probably hated and who had different beliefs in him, than him and who he didn't want to be in relationship with and he didn't want to be in community with. And in the very 12 disciples of Jesus and his closest followers, there were major dividing lines between zealots and tax collectors and fishermen and and. and people that were on their way to becoming religious leaders. There, there were all of these dividing lines, and Jesus brings them all together. And, and John writes this, everybody, no matter their background or who they were before Jesus, everybody who came to believe in Jesus. And remember, that their understanding of belief and the word belief doesn't just mean head knowledge. 
It was action oriented. It, it, it was, it was uh, to believe that you took it on. All of you believed. Your heart and soul was now for and oriented towards him. To believe means to, to literally to follow and to, to give everything of yourself to him. Not just to believe in your head, but to also believe in your heart and take action upon it. To all who believe, he gave the right to become children. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Everyone who believed was brought in. This was the action and the beginning of the transformation. And this was now their identity. No matter what their identity was before, their identity now was that of a child of God. Not simply a servant of God. Not, not one who knows a lot about God. Um but a child of God. A child says that you're close. A child says that you know and you trust and you love your parent. And a child says that everything that the parent has is now yours. It's this beautiful picture that no matter who you were before Jesus, by entering into belief and knowing Him and choosing to follow, means that you have a brand new identity. And you're transformed. You're not who you were. And this is where the transformation happens. In the act of falling, by being brought near and coming to know you can't stay the same. You can't get into God's presence and stay the same. You can't remain in your sin while you're following Jesus. You just can't do it. You can't keep following if, if you don't let go of those things, of those identities. And that's where you begin to change. You begin to become more like Him and look more like Him. That's the order. And John says, this is what happened to us. This is what happens to all who begin to follow. And so in verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full. And this, this, is a, um, this, this has changed my life. This one statement, full of grace. If, if you want to know what the, what the test is, if there's something that you can hold up to say, okay, am I truly following Jesus? Am I looking like Jesus? Is, is this looking more like Jesus? Am I becoming more like Jesus? John said that when God became flesh, when the, the, the divine incarnate glory of God became flesh and walked on the earth and we saw him, this is what we saw, that he was Full, overflowing with both grace and truth. We like one or the other. But we, these two things are really difficult to, to uh, live together. Well, we, we like to hold on to the truth, or we like to hold on to grace, but John said it was both. And then Jesus was both. He wasn't half grace and half truth, he was full of grace. And truth. And truth that says, you're a sinner. And you're going to die in your sin. And there's, there's no escape from it in your own strength but grace. That says, come near. I, I want to eat with you. I want to sit at your table. Uh, invite me into your house. I want to forgive you of those sins. I want to know you so that you can know me. You're a sinner. But I've come to save you. Grace and truth. And if you look at every story and every single interaction with Jesus of every person, no matter where they come from, no matter their background, no matter if they were a religious leader or a prostitute or a leper or, or, or a self-righteous hypocrite or whoever it was, it didn't matter. You see both of these things fully, completely overflowing. Jesus was truth and he was grace always. And so if we're going to get to know Him, and we're going to become more like Him, and draw closer to Him, I just want to ask that you would begin in this place. Is, is the life that you live, or what you believe about God, the God that you know, the God that you've come to faith in, is He full of grace and truth? And if He's not, maybe you've come to believe in the wrong God. Maybe your beliefs about God, and the, the God that you think you know isn't really the true one that he is and that he came to reveal about himself. 
Because he's overflowing with grace and truth. Grace that says all are welcome. Truth that says you can't stay the same. But I want to change you. I want to give you a new identity. But all are welcome. Everyone has a seat. But you can't stay the same. So as followers of Jesus, as we end today, um, I, w- I want to ask you guys that you would you would uphold these in your hearts and your minds. And you would look at examine your life. Examine uh, your, your, your beliefs and the way that you're living. What you see is the most important things. And, and maybe, just like John began with this, that, that this was the beginning of who Jesus was and understanding of who Jesus was and of truly coming to know Him. But you look at the grace, the truth, your life? Am I loving people with truth? And am I, am I being honest with them whenever there's something that, that I see? Is it, it's not loving to, to let somebody walk into destruction. It's not loving to let somebody with a blindfold walk, walk off of a cliff. But it's also not graceful to shout from behind your phone screen because somebody believes something wrong about what you think is right. I think there's a whole lot more of of intimacy and relationship and personal conversations that we need to have to uphold this. Rather than standing from a distance shouting, we need to get closer to one another. As we draw closer to God, He's going to bring us into, into, into intimacy and relationship with other people. Other people who we don't get along with. Other people who we don't agree with. And grace and truth says that we uphold the truth and complete love, just like Jesus did. And I think this is a really great place to begin because it's something that the world doesn't see. It's not the way of the world. It's not the, the, the thing that, that most people, uh, it's, it's not compatible in our own flesh. We can't get there in our own strength. But this is the way of Jesus. This is His life. And so if we're becoming more like Him, then we will become more like this. And we will begin to do more of this. So behold Him. Look at him, reading the, the, the passages in Scripture about how he interacted with other people. And spend time in prayer about asking him and, and then seeking him for how, how to deal with specific situations. And God, how can, how can I be, if you're somebody who, who, who really, you know, you're, you're a truth person, but you're not much of a great grace person. God, how can I be more graceful to you? And if you're all grace all the time, God, how, how do I need to be more truthful to those in my life? How can I be more like you and uphold both at the same time, full of grace and full of truth? And, and God, what are you trying to show me about yourself? Is there something in my own life, in my own heart, that, that, that you want to give me grace on or that I need your truth on? Because as he transforms us in our own hearts and we begin to be transformed by his presence, then we can offer more of who he is into the world. So we're going we're gonna to step into a time of worship and of prayer. Um, but sometimes the place that we have to begin is just like John, just behold him. Just, just sit still, be quiet, and fill your, your mind with all of the thoughts. Um, and in this, in this moment of, of worship and of prayer, just sit in his presence. Just, if you don't want to stand up, stand up. It's okay. If you don't, don't want to... Let's sing the words. It's, it's, it's all right. Just take a moment. And, and take a moment every day to sit in his presence. And, and let him speak to you. Let him come to you as, as you, you posture your heart towards him. So you can get to know him. So he can show you his heart. Ask him maybe, hey, Jesus, what do you want to show me? What, 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 what do you want to speak to me in my life? And then wait. Wait for days if it takes it. Just let him minister and speak to you as you draw closer to him. You guys bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you so much that you have made yourself known. That you want to be known. That you sent your son so that you could be known. That we have to look no further than the person of Jesus. And through his work and resurrection death of the cross, we have complete access to you. We can boldly approach your throne of grace. We have your life that comes and dwells within us through your Holy Spirit. We can know you intimately, 
closer than a friend, closer than a brother, closer than any other earthly relationship. We can come into your presence and we can come to know you, the real you. And so, Father, um, just as a people today, we seek you and we seek your face above everything else, God. We humble ourselves. We let go of the past week. We let go of the, the things that are filling our hearts and our minds that are that are bringing us to worry and that are bringing us to to to, uh, to all of the cares of this world and real things and heartbreaking things and painful things. And God, we lay them at your feet right now uh, in this moment, Father, as we draw near to your presence. God, we ask that just like your word says, as we draw near to you, you draw near. God, reveal yourself to us in this truth, grace. Help us to come to more and more revelation of who you are, of the real you, God, because we need the real you. The world needs the real you, and you've chosen to reveal yourself through your Son, and we can come to you now. Father, we love you. We thank you for this grace. Thank you for your truth that we are we are not good enough on our own. We can never get there, God. But because of your great love, because you sent your son, because of the cross, we have access completely to you. Father, I pray for anybody in here who doesn't know you, has never truly believed in you. Believe with their heart, not just their head, God. And I just pray um, right now in this moment, this week. The beginning of the story, the beginning of the journey of coming to know you, of coming into your presence and choosing to lay down their life to follow.